What's up, BBN? Welcome back to the Kentucky Connection Pod. We have a great episode today after our Kentucky Wildcats walked into the swamp and beat 12th ranked Florida yesterday. Uh, we got Laren back with us today. It's been a while since me and him have been on here. Um, you know, just been got a lot going on. But how you been, Laren? Good to have you back. Uh, yeah, I've been pretty good. Been wanting to get these out there again, but you know, school, work, everything got in the way. But finally, getting some free time. So back at oh. it we go. Oh yeah, and we had to. We have to talk about that game last night. Um, you know, definitely a statement win for Mark Stoops. You know, all this hype going in for Florida and how they jumped from unranked to being the twelfth ranked team in the country, and you know, Anthony Richardson getting all this Heisman talk after one game, didn't even throw a touchdown in the first game, and they're calling him a Heisman candidate and comparing him to Cam Newton and Vince Young, and so the the. The love for Florida was very high going in, and I, I'm not even going to lie. I kind of bought into it a little bit. I kind of was worried that we were going to lose this game. You know, walking into the swamp, you know, we are notoriously historically bad against Florida. So I kind of bought into the hype a little bit. Not not that I thought Anthony Richardson was what they were saying he was, but I did think that Florida, you know, was a really good team and that the swamp obviously is a tough place to play. But we went in there. Um, honestly, I don't want to say we dominated, but – it, it never really seemed like it was too much in question. Uh, yeah, the first half to me was more of a – sorry, let me scoot up. The first half to me was more of a uh, – like, it was close. It wasn't like 16, 13 at halftime. Mm-hmm. And so um, the first half was, like, way closer. It was a game. And then the second half, I don't know what Brad Brad White did to that defense, but they didn't – Florida didn't score in the second half. Yeah, I mean, shutting out a team at home, you know, with such a quote unquote dynamic quarterback and they didn't score a single point in the second half is extremely impressive. And like you said, that defense, I mean, you look at what some of these guys on the defense did. You know, we unsuspended Jordan right before this game, which was kind of controversial. People were like, of course, they unsuspend him right before the Florida game. But he had that one handed interception that set us up to, uh, you know, get an easy touchdown in the uh, red zone. Um, he had a sack. He had two tackles for a loss. So Jordan Jordan Wright was pivotal, you know, on that defense. But then, you know, we talked a little bit before about how, you know, unfortunately Jalen Geiger, our starting strong safety, went out. Um, it looks like he might have a serious injury, could could end up being out for the season. Um, you know, we don't speculate too much before they say that, but it looks like he is going to be out for an extended period of time. But Jordan Lovett, um, who was the, he was like the MVP of the spring game, was getting a lot of hype. He came in. And he only played, like, what, two and a half quarters and ended up second yeah. on the team in tackles. So what's funny, so he went to North Harden High School, which is close to where I played uh, high school ball, Central Harden. And his sophomore year, they didn't know what position to put him at because receiver was stacked because they, uh, they had, like, two receivers that went to uh, Kentucky Wesleyan and one went to like, Arkansas State. So uh, coach was like, hey, do you mind playing defense? So Jordan Lovett didn't play defense until his junior year. Like, that was his main spot. And that year he was first or second in the state with 15 interceptions. Yeah, I mean, we, we knew he was a ball hawk, but he's also just all over the field for tackles. You know, Jordan Lovett's going to be a star. It sucks, you know, what happened to Jalen Geiger. You know, wish a quick recovery on him. He's a very important part of that secondary. Was it his senior year? Or? No, he's a junior, I believe. Okay. So, he'll, I mean, either way, I'd still think he'd probably get a medical – a medical waiver if if he were to miss the season um but overall just a great game you know from the defense carrington valentine had a big pass a couple big pass breakups you know he showed up you know um of course kedron smith had that big pick six to put us in in the lead uh, so the defense you know showed up two interceptions um you know one of my major concerns after miami of ohio was our ability to get to the quarterback because we didn't pressure yeah the quarterback at all. And I'm like, wow, our D line is cooked. Like we, we can't even get to the quarterback against Miami of Ohio, but something they adjusted and tweaked something in practice. Of course, getting Jordan right back helped a lot, but that we were in the backfield on almost every pass play, you know, Anthony Richardson just couldn't do anything. Um, and I think that's a big reason why we were able to shut him out. Yeah. Um, the one player I wanted to talk about real quick on the defensive line, true freshman Dion Walker. He had that one hit on the like third and five, when he blew up the run. Yep. Yeah. And uh, personally to me, that looked like a helmet to helmet play, but you know, we're not going <laughs> to talk about it. But yeah, that to me, Deion Walker. And then um, another one that played at North Harden with Love It, Octavius Oxidine. He was big off the end. So, I mean, those two alone, I forgot who's on the other side, but Weaver and then. Right. One more. 
But like oh, our yeah. defensive, our defensive line, they got two in the second half. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, when you look in the middle there, just Oxendine and Walker alone, that is a great duo in the middle. I mean, it's going to be hard for anybody to run on that on those two guys. I mean, Deion Walker's a true freshman. He's already the, like the biggest guy on the defense and he's just I mean, like when when you talk about that play when he blew up the run on third and five, he literally threw the O-lineman onto the ground, like just yeah. ran him over and then trucked the running back and it's like, bro, this guy's 18 years old like and he's already doing this. And I think my comparison for him is um you know, Georgia had Jordan Davis last year, you yeah. know, that big, massive guy in the middle who just manhandles people. That's Dion Walker. Like, that is what they want Dion Walker to be. And I think that that is exactly what he's going to be. You know, 6'6, I think he's like 360 or something, 350. He's absolutely huge. Um, and he's going to be a superstar on that defensive line for the next couple of years. Um, but looking at things offensively, you know, Coming in, the big talk was between Anthony Richardson and Will Levis, you know, a big head-to-head -head between two NFL-caliber quarterbacks. Of course, Richardson was getting just ridiculous hype coming into this game. I was watching the ESPN pregame shows, and they were comparing him to Cam Newton. They were comparing him to Vince Young, Dak Prescott. You know, they said he has the arm strength of Josh Allen, who's like the best quarterback in the NFL right now. And I'm like, okay, this guy, he did not throw a single touchdown in their opener against Utah. And y'all are already like I knew for a fact that he wasn't going to live up to those lofty expectations. Um, and he went 14 for 35, 143 yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions, and he only had four rushing yards. The next Cam Newton had four rushing yards. <laughs> um, and then you look at the other side with us and Will Levis. And honestly, I didn't think Will played a great game. You know, he went 13 for 24, 202 yards, one touchdown, one pick, and he uh, had a QB sneak for a rushing touchdown. So he counted for two touchdowns. Um, you know, he had the one pick, which actually wasn't even a pick. I, I was kind of mad that they called it a pick. It was a fumble, in my opinion. You know, he got blindsided and, and you know, lost the ball. I felt like that was a fumble, so I don't even really count that as Will's fault. That was the, on the O-line. But uh, really, the only play that stood out from Will Levis was that 55-yard bomb to Dane Key, which was a beautiful throw. I mean, that was an NFL-caliber yeah. throw. And then true freshman Dane Key goes up and mosses the guy and comes down with it. Like, that was definitely, I feel like, the most exciting play of the game for the Cats. Yeah, the um, like right before the game, I got on Instagram, and I seen like 22 NFL scouts were there. Mm -hmm. And it was mainly for Kentucky versus Florida, but then in parentheses, it was like Will Levis versus Anthony Richardson. Right. And I feel like after that game, there's no question who the better quarterback is. No, it's absolutely Levis. I mean, he he's head and shoulders, like, way better of a passer, and it's not even close. And then, I mean, Levis, you can tell that Scangarello does not want Levis to run the football because, I mean, you know, you just look at what Levis did on the ground last year. He's a weapon on the ground, but he hasn't even – there hasn't even been a single designed run for him this year. He's not been running out of the pocket. Like, he's he definitely is wants to be a pocket-passing quarterback. Um, so it's a, it's a little unfortunate that we're not going to see him hurdling people and trucking people as much as he was last year. But, I mean, I don't even think it's that much of a difference – in, in the run game between the two quarterbacks when you really look at it. I think that what Levis brings to the table passing-wise, he is just head and shoulders a better quarterback prospect for the NFL. I just don't even think it's really close. But um, in the first half, our offensive line was abysmal. You know, uh, Will Levis was getting hit on pretty much every single pass play, which is exactly what happened against Miami of Ohio. We were not opening any, any holes for our running game. You know, I think we had like two – rushing yards in the first half, something like that. We, we, it was like, I know um, at one point in the first half we had negative two rushing yards. And then yeah. there was another uh, infographic that showed we had one versus 101 for Florida. Yeah. Yeah. We half. had literally zero run game. And I mean, we can attribute a lot of that to the fact that number one, we were missing one of the best running backs in the country, Chris Rodriguez, who's still okay. out. Uh, we, you know, our backup running back, Ramon Jefferson, tore his ACL, most likely out for the season. And then our third string running back, Jaton McLean, was injured. So we're missing our top three guys. And so, uh, but I do want to go ahead and give props where it's due because Cavassier Smoke in the second half was huge. He he did a great job of putting the game away from us or for us. Um, you know, when we were, you know, Stoops likes to play conservative when we're up by a little bit. He doesn't want to take any chances and turn the ball over. So we started running and I was worried. I'm like, we have no run game right now, so I don't think this conservative approach is going to work. But Cavassier Smoke did a great job in the second half. He finished with 80 rushing yards. Uh, Lavelle Wright didn't do as good as I thought he would, but, you know, he's still very young. Uh, 11 carries for 27 yards for Lavelle Wright. But 
Um, big props to the offensive line for turning things around in the second half. You know, Levis wasn't getting hit as much, and we were opening up holes for that run game to, to put the game away. Yeah, and at one point, I looked in the backfield, and I'm like, we don't have a running back back there. And then I see number nine, and I'm like, there's no way we got Tavion Robinson <laughs> in our backfield. And, then, like, I got to thinking, you think about it, a few years ago, if our first string running back goes down, we're done. Yeah. And now we're throwing receivers at – running back because we have depth at wide receiver. You know, Magwood had that tipped catch and uh, key. Like, we have all these people to go in now so we can afford to move a wide receiver or two to the backfield if we need to. Yeah, and, I mean, Robinson had a nice six-yard run out of the backfield. You know, he he did a couple things. Um, you know, I, it's obviously not his position, but – uh, when when you're thin at the position like that, something I'm I've been really concerned about is the fact that we are not seeing any of Mike Drennan, and I was really hoping we would get to see him a little bit tonight because he was great in the spring game. He had like three rushing touchdowns in the spring game. Spring game, he looked explosive. He looked strong, um, but we haven't seen any of Michael Drennan in any capacity. The dude's a former ESPN 300 guy. He was like the number two all-purpose back or the number one all-purpose back in his class he picked us over Florida so like I was really hoping to maybe see Mike Drennan get some touches but he I mean it's like he's not even there I, Drennan picked us over Florida mm -hmm. yeah he fa he actually faked out I remember watching the commitment he picked up the Florida hat put it on and then threw it and put on the Kentucky hat I know it was because McLean and Drennan came in the same class one of them picked us over Ohio State that was McLean Okay. McLean yeah. picked us over Ohio State. Drennan picked us over for or picked us over Florida. Yeah. And I remember, uh, are they both juniors? I or think they're sophomores? both red shirt sophomores. So uh, yeah, their first year would have been the COVID year. Everyone was saying that Drennan was going to be the better one, and then yeah. all all of a sudden you just see McLean as our third string. Well, was third string. Yeah, I mean, Drennan was, like I said, I mean, he was a four-star, you know, very highly recruited. You know, he had offers from Ohio State. He had offers from, you know, team big-name teams like that and then picked us over Florida. So, you know, I was I, – I, I, at this point after this, you know, when we're this thin at running back and he still doesn't even see the field, I feel like Drennan is just not – they just don't feel like he's that guy. So I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe him enter the transfer portal at the end of the year. Obviously, I don't want him to, but that's just something I think we should look out for that nobody's really talking about. Um, but I, it was funny with our offensive line playing so bad in the first half. You know, Jeremy Flax was getting absolutely cooked on that right side on every single play. I, you see his Twitter thing? Yeah, somebody, somebody, the Barstool guy, the Barstool account tweeted, like, get 77 off the field. And he was like, we'll yes, do sir. or something like we'll that. Do. Yeah. Oh man, I don't. I hope he doesn't take that ser too seriously. But uh, he was getting cooked in the first half, and I. It's funny because I actually, I tweeted something out that I thought was a little bit funny. I tweeted out, "Can D Beckwith play right tackle?" Because D Beckwith, you know, <laughs> our, he's one of our running backs. He's like six five, two fifty. I'm like, can he play right tackle? Because man, it was it was rough in that first half. Have you seen the life. picture of Beckwith uh, in practice with the other running backs? Yeah, he's he the dude like, is just ridiculously huge. He is so large. Yeah. I mean, and it's just pure muscle. Like he's just a freak. He just he's built like Derrick Henry. So I hope yeah, we find a way to I hope we find a way to incorporate him in some way because I mean, I know he's listed as a receiver technically right now, but uh, you know, Again, I was surprised. I was just surprised we only saw two running backs touch the football. I was surprised that with how thin we are, we didn't give, you know, Drennan a shot or Beck with a shot or something like that. But, you know, not not to be down, you know, it's a big win, and I'm very happy that we won. I'm not trying to, like, you know, be negative about it, but I just wish we'd have maybe seen a couple more guys maybe get an opportunity, you know, with Lavelle struggling and then with, you know, Smoke struggling in the first half. But overall, you know, the offense wasn't great, but uh, the defense put us in position, you know, with the pick six and then the the um, Jordan Wright interception that put us, you know, in the red zone for an easy and score. Two four and outs at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Getting those stops. I mean, they couldn't do anything in the second half, you know, zero points in the second half. You know, you're it, it's it's really incredible what and, and and it was just never really in question to me like usually i'm very stressed out during games like this but i wasn't stressed at all during this game for what not even in the first half it, i kind of always just felt like we were better and i feel like that is so huge dude as a kentucky fan you know we went 30 plus years without ever beating this team and now i'm not even concerned walking into the swamp i'm not even stressed out like that's crazy to think about
three out of the last five years, we've yeah. beaten them twice. Was in Florida in Gainesville. Yeah. Two wins in the swamp over the last five years. You know, we beat them. Now we've beat them back to back for the first time since 1977. That's like that's huge. Right. So you know, if that's not an indication that this program is headed for great things, I don't know what is. And when you think about the fact that so many major contributors on this team are freshmen and they still have four more years of eligibility left, like where's this team going to be in four years when you have you know a senior Dane Key or you know a junior Barry on Brown. Um, you know, a junior Dion Walker, a junior Keaton Wade, like the, the, the amount of young talent on this team is insane. And the fact that we're doing this now, you know, I, I can't wait to see, you know, some of these guys progress. Um, but in the receiving game overall, you know, like you said, Magwood had that big tipped pass. That was nice. He had two catches for 47 yards. You know, he had a touchdown last week. So Chauncey Magwood is already showing that he's going to be a contributor um, on this team in the receiving game. And then we in the first half, we got the tight ends involved super early. Uh, I remember Brendan Bates had that first down catch, and then Jordan Dingle had two first down catches, and then Keaton Upshaw had two first down catches all in the first half. So getting those tight ends involved early was big time. Yeah, the coaches poll, they have us at 10, which I think is a little high. I mean, we'll probably be somewhere between 12 and 16 in my opinion. Oh, no, the AP poll came out. We're ninth. The AP poll came out? Yeah, came out an hour ago. We're ninth. We are ninth in the country. But like you said, we have all those freshmen. Imagine what which someone that is going to school to be like a nutritionist or a dietitian. Imagine what if they get their like diet right and then they like work out and they're in a college gym for like two years. Just imagine like not to be too, I guess, optimistic. But Deion Walker could be the next Jordan Davis. You know, I mean, it's Absolutely. not out of the realm of possibilities. I mean, they Absolutely. were comparing him last night as a true freshman. They were comparing him to Jordan Davis. So, I mean, yeah. it's Absolutely. there. And I think that's a valid comparison. And then I saw a really cool comparison for Dane Key. Uh, he got compared to Devontae Smith. And I think that that's – it makes sense. You know, he's kind of a skinny – but athletic and lanky receiver, you know, he can go up there for the jump balls. He's super quick, long stride. So I think that Devontae Smith won the Heisman. So, <laughs> you know, that's – we're getting these guys compared to some big-name dudes. You know, Barry and Brown obviously is going to be a superstar. You know, he he didn't really – they they game plan for him pretty well. But um, overall, you know, I am so ridiculously optimistic, you know, for the future because, I mean, these young guys contributing. Dane Key – is 18 years old and has two touchdowns in the first two weeks. And that's like, that's huge. Yeah. First, uh, first two weeks of college football, he has two touchdowns and he has one cash Daniel impersonation. Got yeah. Oh, I saw that. That was <laughs> great, bro. Uh, the Florida wow. players are roasting him or not Florida. Kentucky players are roasting him in the comments. They're like, Oh, he drowned himself. Yeah. I saw the Cavassier said that as a boy drowned himself. It was so funny. But, uh, I was really happy for Cavassier though, because um, I know we were when we stopped him the two four and outs at the end, we were just trying to run the ball and kill time, kick a field goal, maybe score a touchdown. And when he, ba- I think it was that time, he bounced it outside to get the first down. Mm-hmm. He he's been waiting for so long for his time and finally coming. Yeah, yeah, and I did I did feel bad for him in the first half because I think a lot of that was the O line not opening up holes for him. You know that that Florida defense is good, and we're no, yeah. we're not talking about that. That Florida defense is really really good. They've got they've got multiple NFL guys on that defense, and the offense held their own. And and once that O line got adjusted in the second half, man, it was like we were playing more physical than them. And I just think that overall, there's just so much to be optimistic about for this team. Um, you know, to where we didn't even have a good offensive game and we still beat a top 12 team by double digits without playing well offensively. So it's like if that offense can click, man, this is a scary team. And then we're ranked ninth right now. We The AP poll came out. We are ranked ninth in the country. We have two very easy games coming up, you know, easy in quotes because you don't want to overlook them. You know, we almost lost to Chattanooga last year, but you – know, <laughs> In quotes, easy games, but we're ranked ninth right now. If we win these next two games pretty handily and there's some other losses in the top ten, dude, like there is a world where we go into Ole Miss ranked in the top five, I think, and I think that's a valid possibility. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the AP poll right now. It's, I mean, we all knew when Bama struggled with Texas, which not bashing Texas, but when Bama struggled with Texas, we all knew Georgia was going to get the first place. And it's like Georgia, Bama, Ohio State. After that – it's Michigan, Clemson, Oklahoma, USC, and Oklahoma State. Like, we could be fourth 
going into Ole Miss. We're better than Oklahoma State, bro. 100%. Yeah, we're There's better no than Oklahoma State. And, and Michigan then, isn't that impressive to me either. Michigan, Oklahoma State, and then uh, Oklahoma. I mean, the first year under Brent Venables. I think I mean, we're better than Oklahoma. I'm not even going to lie to you. So, I mean, realistically, it, in terms of us talking, it'd be Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, maybe Clemson or USC, and then Kentucky. Yeah, I think there is a I think there is a realm of possibility where we go into Ole Miss as a top five team, which is just insane to think about. This is the first time in the, excuse me. This is the first time in the Stoops era we've been in the top ten. I didn't realize that. This is the first time ever in the Stoops era we've been in the top ten. We never touched the top ten in 2018, 2019? Nope. We finished eleventh that year. I thought in one of them though, we were over Ohio State in the first initial college football playoff. Well, mm-hmm. I don't know. I saw something uh, earlier about how this is the first time under under Stoops that we've been in the top ten. And if – I mean, knock on wood, I mean, we are – we're Kentucky, you know, we curse a little bit. But, I um, mean, we have two easy games coming up. Yeah. We shouldn't lose them. So. No. No, I don't think Young um, – well, Youngstown definitely not. I mean, NIU is a sneaky team because I think they they're one of the best conference. teams in their – yeah, they, they won their conference last year and they're still one of the best teams in their conference. So that's sneaky. Don't overlook them. Um, and then Ole Miss hasn't been overly impressive in the first little bit. I mean, this that was one of the teams I was kind of worried we'd struggle with, but I don't know if Ole Miss is better than Florida. So, you know, we could walk into Oxford and maybe get another big time road win. And I think if we walk into Oxford and we beat Mississippi or if we beat Ole Miss at Ole Miss, I don't think you can argue that we're a top five team at that point. 100%. Yeah. Looking at this, Youngstown State, Northern Illinois. I mean, Ole Miss is the one game I would, like, circle. But then you got South Carolina. Spencer Rattler does not look good at all. No, not at all. Um, Mississippi State. Tennessee's been impressive to me a little bit. But then Missouri, Vandy, Georgia, Louisville. So, I mean, there's three games I'm not worried but have some doubt. I think we are undoubtedly better than Ole Miss, undoubtedly better than South Carolina, undoubtedly better than Mississippi State. Tennessee, obviously, I think we're better than them, but we are. It is genuinely crazy how cursed we are against Tennessee. So, right. would not surprise me in the slightest if we lose to them. But Missouri is one of the worst teams in the in Power Five, and then Vanderbilt obviously is the worst team in the conference. So those shouldn't be too much of a problem. Georgia, I've seen a lot of Kentucky fans. You know, like I get, I get the optimism, and I think anything's possible. But I just still think that Georgia's talent gap is just too high. But um, I, I put out a. A schedule prediction right before the season started on TikTok, and I said I think we go eleven and one, and it was very controversial. But I think Georgia is the only game that I'm like convinced we're, we we won't win. Like everything else, I'm pretty optimistic on. I mean, if our defense balls out, and then we keep on making adjustments to the O line, I mean, I I feel like we're better than Tennessee. Uh, and then Hooker, I feel like it's the same level as like KJ Jefferson and. Um, Anthony Richardson. I feel like he's being overhyped. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Hooker's really good just because he's an efficient guy and he can run their quick offense without making mistakes. And I, he's very accurate. And I think all that's very important. I don't think he projects as an NFL guy, really, but he's a great college quarterback for sure. Um, but I mean, we were better than Tennessee last year, but we still lost. And that's kind of the problem. Like in 2018, the Benny Snell team, as we were a million times better than Tennessee. They they went like five and seven that, that year and they still blew us out. And it's just like, there's, there is some serious curse go, curses going on. Um, I mean, the, the only time we've beat them in the last few years is when, uh, you know, we went into Neyland and they threw like three pick sixes in the first half. You know, that was, that, that was, was the COVID year, right? Mm-hmm, that was the COVID yeah. year. And Garantano threw three pick sixes in the first half. And it's like, okay, there we go. You know, it's like kind of hard to lose that game at that point, but um, you know, not again. Not trying to be pessimistic. I'm very happy with the way the team is going, but uh, I, uh, the offense has to figure it out. The offense has got to get it figured out. It's just I mean, you got to think though. The offensive line they had Jagger Burton. He was he's a redshirt freshman or redshirt sophomore, mm-hmm. and this is the first time he started. And then week one we had David Wallaball at right tackle. He was a true freshman. Yeah, he was barking I mean, chicken in that game, bro. He was. I think you give him a year or two with his frame, and he'll be a college right tackle, but he needs time. Yeah. I think, I think it's an interesting – we haven't seen Keontae Goodwin very much. I feel like if um, Flax 
struggles a little bit in the next two games. Before we go to Ole Miss, I feel like Goodwin will get some reps. I mean, the next two games, you kind of have to give him reps. I mean, he's you're playing, you know, far inferior competition. I feel like you kind of have to give Keontae Goodwin some reps. You know, he's your five-star freshman. He's your the prize of your recruiting class, and you're letting all these other true freshmen play. So I think, you know, it's definitely necessary to throw Keontae in there in the next two games, especially like against Youngstown. I don't see why you wouldn't, um, you know, throw him in there. Another thing that's super interesting is like we're 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 very happy with our receiving game, you know, like Magwood's been playing well, you know, Barry and Brown, Dane Key, but think about it, we haven't seen Dakel Crowdis yet. We haven't seen much of Chris Lewis yet. Those are two former four star guys who are still looking to break in the rotation. And they say Dakel Crowdis is a, a very electric guy. I don't know if he's still kind of lingering with that inner injury or what, but I don't even think he's like been on the field yet. Um, so you know. We've got all these weapons at receiver, but we still haven't even seen some some of these guys who could end up being contributors. You know, um, the receiving core, it, like we have a decent receiving core right now. I mean, they're, a lot of them are young. I mean, I wouldn't say inexperienced now if they're going into the swamp and beating them. But, I mean, thank you in respects to him. But Javon Baker at UCF was going off for them against Louisville. I mean, yeah. if we had Javon Baker – We'll let yeah, us be looking like Aaron Rodgers. For real. Imagine a receiving core, like the starting line, uh, the starting receiving core would be Baker and Key on the outside and then uh, Tavion in the slot. Like that would be crazy. And then Barion would be the first guy off the bench rotation-wise. And then you have Lewis, Crowdis, Magwood, uh, Demarcus Harris. Yeah. I've been surprised yeah. Harris only has like one catch through the first two games. I thought he'd be – I mean, he's the most experienced guy on the field – for us uh, at receiver, so I'm kind of surprised he hasn't been targeted more. Yeah, I mean, outside of Harris, I mean, I, I do wish he would get more reps, but, I mean, our receiving core, our top two receivers last night were two, uh, two freshmen. Well, yeah. a redshirt freshman and then a freshman. So, yeah. yeah, and Magwood, I think Magwood has emerged as the first guy off the bench, as, yeah. like, the first receiver off the bench. He is – really really solid he's not the fastest guy in the world he's not the most athletic guy in the world but he's a great route runner he's got great hands um you know he had that really nice play after the catch um where he like caught the ball and then made a couple guys miss and got a few more yards you know after the catch so it's like he's not just a, a catch and go down type of guy like he's he's got a little bit more to him a little more juice to him so i love our receiving core um and again i think it really just I, something I do want to touch on as something i was frustrated with was some of rich gangarello's play calling i was like we, we used to get on to Eddie Grand for calling screens on second and 30, and that's what Scangarello did a couple times yesterday. I think I feel like we called, like, over 10 screens, and, like, not a single one worked. Like, I feel – I don't remember a single screen play that actually, like, resulted in over two yards. Um, and I just – I don't understand certain coaches and certain play callers, like, obsession with screen plays because, like – Wondell Robinson isn't back there. And, like, Tavion can make plays, but, like, I just don't – I don't understand second and long and you go for a screen, it gets blown up, and then it's third and 20, and it's like, all right. I mean, with you mentioning Wondell, it kind of has me thinking, like, what if they were trying to pull some kind of, like, tunnel screen thing that Wondell had last year where he ran in between all the defenders? And that's and what they, they were, were trying to do, and it right. just – it. W Florida game plan for that perfectly. They knew that that yeah. we that we were going to try to do that a lot, and they they didn't allow a single one. Like not a single screen resulted in positive yardage. You know, Barian had that one screen where he lost two yards, and so it's like okay, we're you know, and, and then there was another one where we we're, were about to score, and Levis like overthrew him on the screen because Levis You're just right. puts a little bit too much juice sometimes. You know, it seems like he doesn't know when to take take the bullet off a little bit. Um, so I think, that, you know, those are just things we need to work on. I think Scangarello just needs to open the playbook a little more. I was kind of disappointed. I thought he said that he was, like, not trying to show a lot against Miami of Ohio. Like, he didn't call very many crazy plays against Miami because he didn't want Florida to game plan. But then we walk into Florida, and he's calling the exact same type of plays. So <laughs> As last year. Yeah. It, well, Liam Cohen was – an a far superior uh, like play caller in my opinion. I just think I mean we, we only have two games of Skang, so I don't want to hate on him. Like I like him. I think that he's going to be really good for like quarterback development and and stuff of, of that nature, but I just his play calling style is more along the lines of a Grand rather than a Liam Cohen. He's like somewhere in the middle between those two. 
I mean, with his NFL experience, I think as the season goes on, he'll understand like what plays do and don't work in college versus the NFL. Right, right. And it, it seems like I, I mentioned this uh, on Twitter yesterday during the game. It seems like he views Tavion Robinson as our version of Debo Samuel, lining him up in the backfield. That's what the 49ers did with Debo Samuel was lining right. him up in the backfield, letting him run, throwing screens to him, just getting the ball in his hands to, to make plays. And it seems like he views Tavion as our version of Debo. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that progresses as the season goes on. Um, but – Looking ahead to next week, you know, Youngstown State, it's a noon kickoff on SEC Network. You know, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Uh, I want to see Will Levis really just have a crazy game. I want to see Levis throw for 400 yards, you know, show us that you can do this, you know, on this stage because all this number one overall pick hype, you know, and through the first two games, there's been a little bit left to be desired. So I would love to see Will Levis just, like, pop off for one of these games and throw a bunch of deep balls and, you know, I want to see the offense open up in these next two weeks. Did you see what the um, – so there were 22 scouts at the game last night. Did you see what the um, one scout said about Will Levis versus Bryce Young yesterday? I know he said that he would take Levis over Young if he was drafting right now. I mean, that was before the game, though. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. after the game, maybe it's more towards Levis in his eyes now? Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Um yeah, before the game, he said he would take Levis. So I wonder if he would still take Levis. So. I mean, the thing that gets me, we're on our own 45, and Levis just launches it. I mean, it kind of reminds me of that meme, F it, you know, uh, someone's down there. Like, F it, yeah. Dane Key's down there. <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, F, for, it, F it, Dane Key's down there. <laughs> Levis threw the ball from the 40, R45, and it was still, like, in the middle of the end zone. That was a gorgeous pass. Like that, it was a perfect spiral, perfect velocity, came down right in his hands, and then Dane made the tough catch. That was a perfect play. That was an NFL play by both guys. Um, just that was definitely the play of the night for the offense. I mean, yep. no, nothing else even came close. Um, but you know, big win, super big win. Now we're ranked in the top ten, and now things become legit here. Now you can't you can't take anything for granted. We can't have a scare. Like la like last year we almost lost to Chattanooga. We overlooked Chattanooga and they almost beat us, dude. We almost lost to an FCS school um while being ranked and we cannot overlook these next two teams before Ole Miss. Um but there's a possibility. I think there's a situation where, you know, we walk into Tennessee on October 29th undefeated and yeah. that would be pretty dope i think we i think if we walk if we're undefeated by that point we're a top five team easily um so i know it might be too early but hear me out so say we run the table i mean we're down our best running back say we get him back i mean if we run the table and lose to georgia in a pretty close game and say a few key teams take a loss throughout the season is there a possibility we're number four who knows i think yeah. it's not out of the realm of possibilities though it's not, especially, you know, if we don't make the SEC championship and then Georgia makes the SEC championship, say they lose to Bama and they fall out of the top four or, you know, Bama loses and falls out of the top four. There's a situation where if one of those two SEC teams loses, those are both going to be top four teams. If one of those teams loses in the, in the uh, SEC championship and they move out of the top four, I don't think it's impossible to think, you know, that that's that could be the case. But that's that's definitely wishful thinking, you know, for sure. But uh, it's I'd love to see State Street that night. Speaking of State Street, <laughs> that uh, that you know, that there's the video of the car getting flipped over. So I decided to wear my State Street Kentucky GTA style shirt, where there's a flipped car, there's a burning couch, you know, there's the tailgate, uh, you know. So that's that's a pretty good indication of. Uh, of what State Street was looking like last night. I mean, come on, burning couches is classic, but don't flip people's cars over, man. Did you see they they interviewed the guy that had the car, and he was like, "I, I'm just in Kentucky visiting right now." <laughs> Bro was just chilling. <laughs> and he just got his. Car. He was like, "I have no idea how I'm going to get home." Is what he oh, told some poor guy, bro. Poor. But guy. But then you got my shirt right here, Kentucky versus Florida from, from uh, last year, last year yeah, 2013, man. and then it's I don't know if you can see that well. Yeah. That's such a sick shirt. <laughs> yeah, he's messing up the – scrap. we got Scratch beating up the Gator. Yep. Yeah, man. Did you see the video of the Gator getting pulled out last night too? Or the video of uh, the guy dragging Gator by the tail? 
Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kentucky leaving Gainesville after beating Florida. Yeah, yeah, man. And the bro, Kentucky Twitter is so funny. Like the memes. Like if you go look at the official Florida, uh, you know, si like the official Florida account. You know, they tweeted out the final score. The entire reply section is just people with the memes like i saw one it was like i bet you assumed lance Ware wouldn't be in the comments it's just a picture of lance Ware. it's like what is going <laughs> on bro like just kentucky some of the twitter is so hit and miss during football season kentucky twitter is hilarious during basketball season they're pretty annoying but yeah um it's uh, man i love it and and uh, TikTok has been a lot of fun the last couple of days too, you know, especially after the game, uh, a lot of views, a lot of interactions and just, you know, post, I, I posted a lot of the memes from, I just screenshotted a bunch of the memes from after the game and just posted them on TikTok and it got like 20,000 views. People thought it was pretty funny. So I don't know if y'all can see it. Uh, I, I made this my background already. Oh, him. <laughs> who is that staring him down? Is that Jordan, right? Uh, I can't tell who that is. I don't know what number it is. Yeah, I can't see the number, and I can't tell who that is. I think it's Jordan Wright, but I'm not sure. I, I think it is. But, yeah, him staring was, down Richardson. I think it was after the interception. Uh, what, Richardson really? slammed him, and I think Jordan Wright got in his face. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great picture. Um, you know, and it was pretty in, indicative of, you know, what – how the game went and how we felt about the game afterwards. You know, I, I just, I, I want to touch again on just the, the amount of, even during the game, bro, the announcers were like, they're hyping up Will or Anthony Richardson at the beginning, talking about he's the next Cam Newton. He's the next Vince Young, blah, 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 blah. Once he starts struggling, they start making excuses for him. Like, Oh, it's only his third start. Uh, you know, it's hard to be a quarterback, blah, blah, blah. It's like, don't compare the guy to some of the best quarterbacks of all time and then make excuses when he sucks. Now, it, it, the dude didn't even like he was over. He he was inaccurate. He wasn't hitting any of his throws. You know he wasn't running. He wasn't a threat to run. We contained him perfectly, and it's just it was just laughable. And I don't blame the kid for people are putting these expectations on him. He seems like a pretty good kid. He didn't. He wasn't like he doesn't seem like there's anything like wrong with him. It doesn't seem like it's getting to his head. He's just he's he just goes out there and plays football. He wasn't complaining about anything. He was just he was just trying to play football and. You know, he took responsibility for the loss after the game. So I don't have anything against him at personally, but just the amount of just gross overhyping that he got was just comical to watch. No, the um the one tab I kept was Roman Harper. Yeah, calling us soft, saying our defense or our, saying that we look softer than usual and stuff like that. And did you see the video in the locker room after the game of uh the first thing Mark Stoops says was, Who's soft now? Like that was yeah. and then um I think the ESPN crew was doing their picks. Let me find the picture. Um, oh, Kirk, so were they all Florida picks except for Kirk Herbstreit? Yeah, it's his face, and at the end it has like, yeah, Dez, Pat, Glenn, and Lee all have Florida, and then Kirk has UK, and he's the one out of the five that has UK. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like Kirk Herbstreit's always been kind of like – He's kind of seen the vision with UK while all the rest of – like it just seems like everyone on these talk shows is so out of touch and they still think Kentucky is the Kentucky they were 10 years ago. And it's like they think that this is a fluke and and that we're not actually that good and that it's all – like these media members are not accepting the fact that we are legit now and they can't get it through their brains that Kentucky's actually good and that Mark right. has proven himself. And it's like they still think that, oh, they're just – They've been lucky the last couple of years. They're going to revert back to what they were 10 years ago. And it's like, no, that's not – we are here to stay. This is the most talented roster we've ever had. It's only going to – these guys are all young. Like, it's so frustrating, but I love it because it gives us bulletin board material and it motivates our guys to go out there and win like they did last night. Oh, yeah, and plus our recruiting classes. I mean, we got five-star Keontae Goodwin, Deion Walker, Dan Key picked us over South Carolina and Michigan. I mean, Barry – Barry and Brown picked us over Alabama, right? Alabama. Yeah, picked us and over And didn't Bama. Chris Lewis consider Bama too? Chris Lewis was – yeah, Chris Lewis was considering some big schools. Right. I mean, we're getting recruiting victories like that now, and everyone's like, oh, they'll they'll go back to 2012 Kentucky soon. Like, yeah, no, no – people not. just – I don't know how – we haven't put them on notice yet. You know, with the last – you know, 2018 – Obviously, some big wins, you know, finish 10 and three, beat Penn State in the bowl game. And then, you know, the the two years after that, slightly struggle a little bit, but, you know, still didn't work bad. And then right. last year, we go 10 and three again. We win the Citrus Bowl again. 
against an Iowa team that was second in the country at one point last year. And, you know, then we come in this year, preseason ranked. And, like, did you see the post from PFF about Kentucky stuns Florida in the swamp? We didn't uh, stun them. Cavassier Smoke said stuns question mark or something like that. He was like, we did this last year, too. We literally did this last year. And then we've three of the last five years we've beat them. And there's over here, like, Kentucky stuns. And then I saw another uh, post about, like, it's one thing to lose to Kentucky and Marshall, but it's another thing to lose to Georgia Southern. And so they were, like, lumping us in with Marshall and saying that Florida losing to Kentucky – is just as embarrassing as Notre Dame losing to Marshall. No. And it's like, what are y'all on right now, bro? We are an SEC team. We were a top 15 recruiting class last year. We have a potential top 10 pick in the NFL draft on our team. You know, we've got a great defense. we got one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Mark Stoops has more than proven himself. He's the winningest coach in school history now. And y'all still want to sit here and, and lump us in with who we were 10 years ago. It's just ridiculous. Can we just talk about how Utah was seventh preseason? Okay, and that the media was still riding the high of them in a shootout with Ohio State last year. Mm. And then Florida beats Utah and jumps up from 37th to 12th. Right. And Kentucky wins and they stay the same. Yeah. Like you beat a team that is only ranked because of a shootout in a bowl game. Right. And you jump up 25 spots. Right. Well, I mean, we did go from 20 to 9. So I do feel like, you know, but, it was a nice jump. But the dominoes of Florida jumping up 25 spots. and then Yeah, no, they should not have jumped that far. That was crazy. No. That was maybe, wild. Maybe 25th or 24th, that, that would have been all right. But going from 37th to 12th, no. Right. Like 20 or 19, I can understand if you beat a top 10 team, you know, whatever. I get it. Um, but – and another thing that's hilarious is that, you know, people are like uh, – Oh, well, Florida wasn't that good, or Utah wasn't that good. Utah's not that good, and now Florida's not that good. Anthony Richardson's overhyped, and they won't give Kentucky credit for beating a good team. They just want to say, instead of saying, hey, Kentucky walked in there and got a nice win, they're like, oh, Florida wasn't that good anyway. And that always happens when we beat somebody. They're like, oh, they weren't that good anyway. Y'all y'all beat a bad team, and it's like, okay, bro. Like, y'all were just calling this dude Cam Newton, and now you're saying he sucks because we shut him out. Maybe we just game plan for him and played well against him, and our team is good enough to shut him out. I mean, you know what Weaver said, right? JJ, yeah, where he said we're not going to let him run all over us, and, and then we're going to have a QB spot all night. Yeah, and then the Florida fans are all like, "Oh, he shouldn't have said that." And then Anthony Richardson ran for four yards. <laughs> Dude, I have a, um, I have a picture. It says Anthony Richardson Heisman campaign, September third, twenty twenty two. To September, September 10th, 10th. 2022. <laughs> exactly. Like, what, bro. Yeah. I mean, his Heisman campaign ended last night. There's no way you win the Heisman w- playing a game like that. There's no way. Right. I mean, unless dude just had, like, the right. And honestly, I low-key hope he goes crazy the rest of the year. I hope that he is, like, I hope he's Johnny Manziel the rest of the year, bro, so that we can say we shut him out and we made him look like a bum when he's actually really good so that people won't, can't sit here and be like, oh, he wasn't that good anyway. I hate that so much. We, maybe we just game plan for him. Maybe Brad White is one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Maybe Mark Stoops is one of the best defensive-minded head coaches in the country, and we shut out a good quarterback. Like, it's ba- baffling to me that we can't get respect even when we walk into the swamp and beat a 12th-ranked team in the country. My only question is, what's the media's excuse? Like, I know I'm being optimistic, but when – our last hump is Georgia. We know that. When we do beat Georgia, what's the media's excuse then? Like, yeah, oh, Georgia lost a bunch of players to the NFL, so it's like I'm not saying it's going to be this year. I'm just saying, if or when we do beat Georgia, what's the media's excuse then? You know, yeah. like, oh, there will be plenty. Trust me. Oh, I mean, plenty of them. the only re- I feel like the main reason behind this is just Coach Stoops coaches an ugly brand of football. We don't play beautiful football where we throw for 600 yards and 12 touchdowns. Like you know, Mike Leach is at Mississippi State. Will Rogers over here throwing for 600 yards a game, bro. And nobody's talking about Will Rogers as an NFL quarterback because he's not that good. But their scheme is sexy to to the eye because they throw the ball 70 times a game and he throws for 600 yards. Mark Stoops isn't like that. Like, we're going to eke it out every time and we're going to win close games and gritty games and physical games. We're not going to be – we're not going to walk into the swamp and beat Florida by 30. Like, that's just not going to happen. So, you know – that's why I think a lot of people still sleep on him because he plays an ugly brand of football to where a casual fan could just watch and be like, oh, they got lucky. Like, they they shouldn't have won this game because they didn't play a beautiful brand of football. But 
one of these days people will wake up. And I think I think instead of the media having excuses, I think if we do beat Georgia, that's when the media wakes up. I think that's when the media will wake up and finally give us our respect. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like if there is a year to beat Georgia, it'd be this year because Stetson Bennett looks like the dude I'd call to f- fix my computer. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> All, all due respect, he's he's a hell of a quarterback. He yeah. does look like an IT guy you'd call for your computer. And, <laughs> That's but, a bit it, bro. The mailman. Um, but, like, outside of Georgia's tight end room and maybe one or two defensive players, I don't think they have a whole lot, personally. Yeah, I mean, I they've got they've – got, you know, they always have good running backs. Like, Kenny Mac- McIntosh is a good running back, and Stetson Bennett is – a, a valid quarterback. I mean, Stetson Bennett has been overly disrespected for a while. He is – he's good. You know, he can do what he's got to do. He's going to go out there. He's going to throw two, 300 yards, a couple touchdowns. He's not Bryce Young, but he's he's a good quarterback, and he's good enough to win you a national championship. He proved that last year. But, um, you know, I, their receivers, you got Lad, McClon- Lad McConkey or whatever the hell his name is. He got the weird name, but he's pretty good. And then Brock Bowers is a demigod at tight end. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, outside of that, I don't know – they have the best one, two, three punch tight end room in the country. There's oh, no – I'm looking it up right here. You got Bowers, 6'4", 230. Washington, 6'7", 265. Yeah. And, and then Washington. Gilbert, 6'5", 240. And Gilbert was like a five-star – He was Gilbert. Eric Gilbert was like the number one tight end. He was like a top five player in his class, went to LSU, and he's like the third string right now, which is just crazy to think about. And then they have, they have a fifth guy – who is – or a fourth guy, last name is Delp. I haven't really seen him, but he they say he's 6'5", 225. Yeah. Like Georgia's yeah. tight end room is the best in the country. There's no way around it. I, I, I agree with you, but honestly, I don't think it's a stretch to say Kentucky has the second best tight end room in the SEC. Oh, 100%. I think that that's actually pretty valid. You've seen what uh, Vince Merrow said about all six, right? Yeah, dude. All six we have will be six. in the NFL. NFL caliber tight ends on the roster. That's crazy. I, and I will say, that's another thing I'm a little bit weird about. I thought Isaiah Cummings was going to break out by now, but it seems like he's like the fourth guy right now in that tight end room. It doesn't seem like Cummings is really like moving along as fast as we thought he would. I mean, we we kind of jumped the gun a little bit saying he looked like Kyle Pitts. because <laughs> he's mean, body frame and everything he does. And he's a mitch, mismatch problem for for uh, linebackers because he's so fast. You know, he used to be a receiver, so right. I don't know what's going on with him and why he's not like. I mean, he had a couple nice touchdowns last year, but I, I just feel like I guess Bates Dingle and um, I mean Dingle's a redshirt freshman. He's already doing what he's doing, but Dingle Bates and Upshaw are obviously the guy. Right, the guys the right three. now. Yeah. Then you got Caddis. I mean Caddis. They say another year or two, and he'll be probably where. Um, Bates and Upshaw are at. Yeah, and I saw him. He was on the field a couple times yesterday. He played yesterday against Florida as a true freshman. So they say right now his strongest, um, like perk or like characteristic is his blocking style. Yeah, they threw him in there for some blocks for sure. Maybe he should yeah. switch to right tackle. <laughs> maybe, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, that is my. If I had to pick one primary concern moving forward, it's still the O line. They played better in the second half, but they've played. Five or they've played seven bad quarters of football and one good quarter of football from what I from what I can tell up to this point. Yeah. So the O line is still definitely a concern, but hopefully they can build some confidence because they're obviously going to be bigger and more physical than the next two teams we play. So maybe they can build some confidence and get some scheme stuff figured out and be good to go. But uh, overall, massive win for the Kentucky Wildcats. I think we've touched on pretty much everything there's t- touch on, unless there's anything else you had in mind. No, just jumped up eleven spots. That's yep. Jumped up eleven spots. Kentucky, the Kentucky Wildcats are a top ten team, and I just think when you say that out loud, thinking about what I I don't I can't speak for everybody, but me growing up, I watched every game in like 20, 2011, 2010, 2012. I watched every single game. I watched us go two and twelve and two and thirteen or whatever whatever it is. Patrick told us at quarterback and we're getting we're losing to Vanderbilt forty five to seven. Like I was yeah. a fan then. Yeah. I watched that game. I sat there and I watched that whole game. And it was like torture, but I watched the whole game because I love Kentucky. So I think that is most this is most rewarding for fans like us who watch right. there's a lot of new fans, bro. There's a lot of people 
that I see on Twitter, and I know they did not sit through those 10 and like, 13. No offense, they, but like Waka Flocka? I mean <laughs> – I just mean like regular fans. Like I'm, but, I'm not going to say names, but there's people on my timeline that I that I interact with consistently, and I know for a fact those dudes did not watch us when we were 2 and 13. Yeah, I remember watching those games, and I'm like, nothing – we're going to be this bad forever. Yeah, and I mean – Dyshawn Mobley, I don't know if you remember him, but like guys like Dyshawn Mobley at running back, and like he, I mean, he was okay at times, but like Raymond Sanders, Jonathan George, like those are the names I remember growing up. And now we're I think here, top the 10. first year I watched Kentucky, we went like two and ten. Uh, there was another key point. Oh, the turnaround of the era of Mark Stoops was the uh, South Carolina game. Yep, South Carolina game. Yep. But Dupree. I, that is that game is ingrained into my skull because you had JoJo, JoJo Kemp had like three hundred rushing yards. Yeah, you had JoJo Kemp who ran for like three ten and two touchdowns and was like playing out of the wildcat the whole time because we didn't have a quarterback. And he got carried off the field like a coach had to k- pick him up. He was so tired, he so walk. exhausted that they literally carried him off the field. JoJo Kemp forever a hero for that. He, he that changed the culture, bro. That changed 100%. the culture. The Bud Dupree tip interception pick six. Place goes crazy. We're wearing the black unis with the chrome helmets. We look sick. That you know, you got the video of them dancing at the at a uh, at midfield. You know, they're yeah. everybody's dancing. You got JD Harmon and just guys like that just sitting there. You know, getting getting crazy at, with it at, at at uh for the kickoff. And it's like this is different right now. And I remember that so vividly. And just think about from that game. That game is still ingrained into my skull. And then yeah. last night, walk into the swamp beat Florida for the second time in a two years in a row, third time in five years, yep. where we went 36 years without beating that team, bro. And now, now we've been three times in five years. Yeah. It's just I could gutch about it forever, man. It's it's a beautiful thing. And I think I think fans need to not take this for granted because we don't know how long this is going to last. Like it, it hopefully Stoop stays here and we continue this and, and it goes great. But you know, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know if this is forever. You know, we're not a dynasty at least not yet. So we, you know, this, yeah. this could end at any point, bro. And so yeah. I think w- from, with what fans have dealt with, with what Kentucky fans have dealt with, like my dad has, you know, been a diehard Kentucky fan his whole life. He grew up watching Kentucky and, you know, just to, I, I can only imagine from his standpoint, from to see what we used to be, what he's watched his entire life. He's watched us be the laughing stock of the SEC for 50 years. And now we're, Arguably the second best team in the East, you know, going to be competing to be. We're a top ten team. I right mean, now. after last night, I think right now it's Georgia, Kentucky in the East. I yeah, mean, Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee is how I would go when the, with yeah. the rankings. But just don't take it for granted, Kentucky fans. You know, soak up these moments, enjoy these moments because it. This is an incredible feeling for me as a fan for seeing through so much agony bro like the joker phillips years were just embarrassing and and yeah. the first few years of stoops career i remember bro people were t- saying fire him people were saying fire stoops after his first two three seasons i mean steven johnson we beat tennessee that was what kept stoops for another year so. yeah steven johnson yeah that saved stoops job he comes back and i think what was that the next year we went we went 10 and 3 benny Snow yep. broke all those records and stuff and so you know we it's I'm glad we were patient with it. You know, build Mark Stoops a statue, pay that man as much money as he wants, you know, make him make him royalty here. Do not let him go. Like I saw I see some people like because Nebraska just fired Scott Frost because they like lost to Georgia Southern yesterday, which is hilarious. But uh <laughs> they, I, the first thing I saw was keep an eye on Mark Stoops to Nebraska. Why would Mark Stoops leave Kentucky. Kentucky all this time building up Kentucky? He's got us as one of the better teams in the SEC, a top four team in the SEC this year, without a doubt. You know, uh, we're over here winning these massive games. He's literally the Messiah in Lexington. And you're saying he's going to leave for a has-been program that hasn't won anything in recent memory? They're completely terrible. There's no like hope on that roster for now. He's going to have Wando left. He's going to have to completely start from scratch. And you're telling me he's going to leave what he's built here at Kentucky in the SEC, where he is literally royalty for Nebraska, where he has to restart and rebuild again. Why would he do that? Like. It's actually hilarious to me that people think that. And if he does take the job and I end up being wrong here, and, like, number one, I don't know why he would do that. But number two, 
I would lose so much hope in like everything, bro. <laughs> There's no way he would leave what he has built here for yeah. Nebraska. Dude wants to go live in a cornfield and rebuild a program in a corn. That's field. all they got. Dude's gonna take it would it would take Honestly, I would say it would take longer to rebuild Nebraska than what he's done at Kentucky. Just it, it, no one wants to play in Nebraska, bro. It's not it, we're not in the fifties anymore. I mean, the thing that I feel like Kentucky and Nebraska, they're obviously way too different brands, and we're in terms of where they're at right now. And the reason Stoops was able to build something here so quick, we're in the SEC. What's exactly. what's the motto with the SEC? It just means more, or it means more. Yeah. And the yeah. SEC brand of football matches Mark Stoops and his personality. I don't see him going to the Big Ten and like nah, he's not a Big Ten coach. No, he's not a Big Ten coach unless he goes to like Iowa or something. Where Which, I mean, that is his alma mater. So it's his alma mater, and they play that ugly, uh, bro. Oh my goodness, can we talk about Iowa for a sec? <laughs> they, bro, week one, <laughs> Iowa scored seven points against South Dakota, who's an FCS school. They scored seven points, and they didn't even score a touchdown. It was two, two safeties and a field, field goal. Oh, my God. And Look. then they lost to Iowa State 10-7 to seven yesterday. 10-7, to seven, bro. That's the worst offense in the country. You know the, um, the like, pregame thing they do where they, like, wave at the kids at the hospital? Yeah, those poor kids got to watch this crap, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was like, Iowa really had those poor kids sit there and watch that game. Two safeties in a field goal against an FCS school. You beat an FCS school seven to three with no touchdowns. That is just the most gross thing I've ever heard, bro. Oh my goodness. I would hate to be an Iowa fan. But even then, it's like, why would Stoops? I don't see a situation where Stoops leaves Kentucky unless Georgia or Bama comes calling. I don't see a situation where Stoops leaves. He turned down LSU last year. Like I, if LSU didn't get Brian Kelly because they went for someone else, and uh, he that coach didn't take it, so they went for Brian Kelly. If Brian Kelly didn't go, Stoops was next on the list. Yeah, Stoops was absolutely on the list, and um, I mean, there's conflicting reports that they offered him, and he said no. Um, and then they move, you know, they but or he was part of like the their final pool, their final decisions, and and he said no, and it's like. If Stoops is not considering leaving for those places, Stoops is not leaving for Nebraska, bro. I mean, think of it, though. Vince Merrow chose to stay here versus going to Michigan State. Yeah. Stoops turned down LSU. Didn't Brad White turn down? Brad White could have been a head coach by now, 100%. 100%. Without a shadow of a doubt, he could have been head coach by now. And so. now his defense is shutting out Florida in the swamp and holding their quarterback to four yards. Yeah, their Heisman years. candidate quarterback to four rushing yards. And, you know, dude, I, what was his completion? His completion percentage was like 40%, which is just hilarious. Like, you know, all that hype to, to throw 40%. Yeah, 40% even. Are you serious? Did I just get that in my yeah. head? With, 0. 0. 14 divided by 35. I failed math like three times, <laughs> and I just guessed his per his pass my, percentage. My last math class I ever had, I got the lowest B possible. So I mean, I had like a thirty five in algebra in my sophomore year of high school. I anyway, Rico. I anyway, I can't believe I just guessed that. That's actually crazy. Uh, I'm gonna just claim that as because I was smart and not it, I didn't get lucky, but. Um, yeah, I mean that's pretty much it. We fully covered it. I mean we've we've talked about one football game for an hour. Uh, you just, usually that's how long these podcasts go is for about an hour, and we usually have like ten different topics. But we just talked about the same game for an hour because it was just there's so much to talk about. There's so much to be excited for. There's so much to be happy about. Kentucky is top ten in the country in football. That yeah. is when you say that sentence out loud, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So we're in the same. Same vicinity as, like, Oklahoma and Clemson right now. Uh, Dabo Sweeney just became the highest paid coach of all time, and we're two spots behind him. We're two spots behind Clemson, who won, like, two championships in the last six years. It's crazy. And we're eight spots away from Bama, who's won, like, seven out of the last 12 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, like I said, just don't – I don't – I just encourage people to not take this for granted because, um, you know, enjoy it while it lasts because I, hopefully it's a forever thing. Hopefully Kentucky's on the map forever, but, you know, we'll just have to see how things go. But um, if that's it for you, that's it for me. I, that's pretty that's much it. everything. I think we've touched on everything. So, um, again, just nice little recap of Kentucky's big win in the swamp. We've got 
Uh, Youngstown State next week should be an easy game. Not really too much to even talk about there. Um, so go Cats. Go Cats.